somebody's chest to listen to their heart and you won't hear anything. But put it on the right side. Because for some people, the heart in their lifetime will actually swing from right or from left to right. And then they have a right axis deviation. Now, this usually happens because of two reasons. One, she's pregnant. And that huge parasite that's growing inside of her <laughs> causing all kinds of problems is going to push up, cause pressure on the heart and actually swing it to the right side. And the same thing can happen with your patients who are morbidly obese. That excess fat in the abdomen can also push the heart to the right side. Now, some people will even have a central deviation. And usually this is because they're very, very tall individuals. Now, the way that we grow is by using growth hormone. And this growth hormone is going to not just affect our height, but it also affects the size of all of our internal organs. So for a person who is like 6'10", 7 foot tall, their heart is going to be very large. Um, that does not allow the connective tissue to become stronger though. And because their heart is so large and so heavy, uh, for many of them the connective tissue will break and instead of the heart being on the left side, it just kind of and hangs down the middle. This gives your patients a lot of problems. They'll have a lot of pain. They have all kinds of cardiac difficulties because of their height. Uh, now, growth hormone, this is secreted from our anterior pituitary. And the interesting thing is, it's only secreted when you're asleep. So if you have kids, okay, and your kids are growing, or you know, maybe it happened to you in your growing years, Forehead, 
our skull bone is about a quarter of an inch, okay, in thickness. But with acromegaly, it gets much thicker, sometimes one to two inches. <coughs> and that pushes on the brain. And now you start squishing their brain. And they start getting really bad headaches. And they also start to get really mean. And you'll see a real big change in personality. And if it compresses the brain, Everything else that's in red, the 
going to be able to continue to beat. A matter of fact, they've actually come up with um, some new fluid. I don't know exactly what it is yet, but it allows a heart, once you put it in this fluid, give it a little oxygen, it can continue to beat for six to eight hours, which is a really good thing because let's say we harvest a heart from someone who died. Now that heart can actually be flown across the country to somebody on the other side who needs a heart transplant. As it was before, you could only give it to somebody who was within an hour of where that person had died. So it allows other people to have an easier time with heart transplants. Okay. So the first very important autorhythmic cells of the heart are the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node. The sinoatrial node is the most important Just 
muscle, from skeletal muscle, is that in between these muscles, you have these long tubes of protein. They're like tunnels that are made out of protein. And these tunnels are called gap junctions. Or sometimes you'll also hear people refer to these as a connexon. Now there's only two types of muscle in the human body that has gap junctions. One is cardiac muscle, the other is the muscle in the uterus. And when we get to the reproductive system, we'll talk about these gap junctions in the uterus just a little bit more. But what these gap junctions do is they allow cardiac muscle to very quickly communicate with each other. Because one thing that has to happen is this muscle has to work together. Because remember, these two chambers are your atria. The bottom two chambers are your ventricles. And if this is your patient's heart, this is their right side, this is their left side. Okay? So this will be the right atria, left atria, right ventricle, left ventricle. And both of the atria contract together. And they're going to contract downward to push the blood into the ventricles. And then which way do the ventricles contract? They contract upward because they're going to push the blood out. The right side of the heart pushes the blood to the lungs. The left side of the heart pushes the blood to the body. And so atria contracted it downward motion. Ventricles contract upward, but they have to contract in a very particular pattern. You can't just have them contracting anywhere they feel like. Everybody's got to contract downward in the atria. Everybody's got to contract upward in the ventricle. So when this first action potential occurs, what we're going to see is we're going to see potassium being repelled. Eventually, the potassium accumulates, and we're going to get another action potential, and that repels potassium more, which accumulates, gives us another action potential. Now, when the potassium is repelled into the gap junction, there's no action potentials, but it just slides through, so the potassium very quickly gets to the next cell and builds up, and you get another action potential. So what we see is we see these action potentials occurring across from the right to the left atrium and repelling potassium the whole way across from right to left. So the SA node is up in the top part of the right atrium. And as soon as it starts that first action potential, remember the heart is 3D. So this potassium is going to be repelled straight across from the right to the left side. But it's going to go around. So from the SA node all the way around the front, all the way around the back of the heart from right to left. And then, as soon as you see this rapid movement from right to left, the next thing you're going to see is you're going to see the potassium coming downward all at the same time. And so this potassium is being repelled in a downward fashion all at the same time, kind of like a curtain dropping through the right atrium and the left atrium, all at the same time, it's coming down. Now, you got the SA node with its very first action potential, sending potassium from the right to the left side of the heart, front and back, all at the same time, followed by the potassium coming down like a curtain. But notice, there are no gap junctions in this last row. The 
sitting underneath of this, this sarcoplasmic reticulum actually wraps around all those proteins, the actin, the myosin, the troponin. So when we really release the calcium, it'll directly bind to the troponin. Any other questions? the ability. 
So, every once in a while, this potassium leakate will close. Now, because it's different from any other potassium leakate, they actually gave it the name of a potassium funny leakate. That's its official name. This is the potassium funny leakate. I would have called it the potassium weird leakate, but whatever. Okay. So this potassium funny leakate can close. So now let's look at the voltage when this potassium funny leakate closes. Sodium is still diffusing in, but potassium cannot diffuse out. So what will happen to the voltage? It goes up. Anytime sodium diffuses in, voltage rises, right? So this voltage will go very quickly from minus 60 to minus 50 millivolts, which we know is what triggers an action potential. And so our first action potential will occur so that every time a potassium funny leak gate closes, the voltage rises to the trigger and we get our first action potential. That first action potential leads to a heartbeat. So I could say every time the potassium funny leak gate closes, the heart beats. So if I told you that the SA node causes our heart to beat 72 to 80 beats per minute. How many times per minute does the potassium funny leak gate close? 72 to 80. So remember, every time on the SA node, the potassium funny leak gate closes. This triggers the first action potential, which triggers a heartbeat. All right, so now let me ask you this. How many times does the potassium funny leak on the bundle of his. 36. Because if the bundle of his was in control, we'd have a heartbeat of 36 beats per minute. But it's not in control, so we go by the SA node unless the SA node goes bad. Now, if the SA node goes bad, the AV node takes over. So how many times are the on the AV node when it takes over. About 54 times per minute. Now watch this, there's a problem though. Not only does the heart beat slower, but notice where the AV node is situated. It's at the bottom of the atrium. So the only thing it can do when it starts its first action potential is stimulate the ventricles. Squeeze the last bits of blood into the face. 
ventricle. And what that does is fills the ventricle so much that the valves snap shut. Okay, so now the ventricles are full of blood. But if the atria didn't contract, there wouldn't be as much blood in the ventricle. It wouldn't be as full. If it's not as full, you can't get as much blood to the lungs and then you can't get as much blood to the rest of the body. And so, number one, their biggest complaint is that they wake up in the middle of the night with shortness of breath. Because if I'm not bringing enough blood into my lungs, I can't pick up enough oxygen. If I'm not picking enough, of, up enough oxygen, my body isn't getting a good enough oxygen supply. And so many times they'll wake up in the middle of the night gasping breath. And that's one of the major signs of your essay note going bad, is that you have this massive shortness of breath, especially when you're laying down, because when you're laying down, does gravity help you? No. And most of my blood, when I'm laying down, gets into the ventricle, because the atria contracts and forces that blood into the ventricle while I'm sleeping. For these patients, until they get a new artificial pacemaker, they have to sleep almost straight up and down so that the blood gets into the ventricle because their atria don't contract at all. Only their ventricles contract. And that's a big problem for them. And so if they're laying down flat, they'll wake up very quickly with shortness of breath because they're not getting almost any blood flow to the body and almost zero oxygen supply. So this is a big problem. By the way, when those ventricles fill up with blood, what they do is they push those valves up. And when those valves, after the atria contract, when those valves snap shut, that's what you're hearing when you listen with a stethoscope. You are actually hearing with your first like, boom, boom sound. You're hearing the AV valves, the right and left AV valve. Shut. The second heart sound that you hear are going to be the pulmonary and the aortic semilunar valves snapping shut. By the way, in the hospitals, you never use the word semilunar. You just call it a pulmonic valve and an aortic valve. When those two snap shut, because the ventricles will squeeze the blood upward, and that pops the valves open. But a little bit of blood trickles back down and slams the valves shut again. When those valves shut the second time, you're hearing those two, the aortic and the pulmonic valve, shutting. So your boom boom, or what they call your lub dub sound, are your tricuspid and bicuspid valve shutting at the same time, and your pulmonic and aortic valve shutting at the same time. So that gives you the boom boom sound that you have. Okay, we'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow during lab but just so that you understand. So what if you're listening to a patient's heart and instead of the lub dub or the boom boom sound, you hear this boom 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 boom. What does that tell you? Say it again. Okay, what else? What are those four sounds that you're hearing? You're not hearing two. All four vowels are shutting at a different time. They're not shutting together. The first two together, the second two together, they're all shutting separately. And it actually sounds like a horse galloping. And so they call this an S4 gallop. And you hear this a lot with nurses who are stressed out. They get S4 gallops a lot. And then their number one symptom, fatigue, because the heart isn't pumping the blood in a nice rhythm and then out to the lungs in a nice rhythm and then out to the body. So they're lacking oxygen and they have a lot of fatigue. Okay, so now we know that this first action potential occurs because the potassium funny leakate closes. However it does, nobody really understands. But we know it closes 
So on the potassium funny leak gate, we have receptors. And the sympathetic nervous system, for instance, we'll start with it first, releases a neurotransmitter.
So if you're stressed out and your heart rate is up, which nervous system are you using? Sympathetic. 